All right, so the, the thing we're going to talk about today in the next class is something that we talked, that, that you might have kind of come into when you were taking the practice exam and said, uh-oh, I don't I have no idea what this stuff is, because in years past, we've, we actually took the midterm a little bit later. Um, or you've seen this in your finance classes. And basically, we're going to talk about the time value of months. Okay? And you might ask, well, you know, if I'm learning about it in finance, why do I need to learn about it in accounting? <laughs> and my answer would be, number one, because it's ne a lot of a good thing is never too, too much. And number two, I think you need to understand why, as accountants, we need to worry about the time value of money. Okay? So uh, it's not just because I think computation is fun, but really we need to use time value concepts in estimating or, comp or calculating the value of some of our financial liabilities, and you need to figure out how that's done. Okay? And similarly, some of our assets. Okay? So we'll talk about how that works in a minute. Okay, so what are the situations where the time value of money kind of comes into play in accounting situations? And the first is the most obvious, which is when the company issues long-term debt or it's planning on buying it back or any situation where we're trying to figure out what is the some value of the debt that we're issuing because we need to put a liability in our books and we need to know what do we what what value should we put with that number okay and that's going to kind of kick in capital leases this is when we lease an asset but it looks and smells more like a purchase Okay, so some of you are renting an apartment now, correct? Do any of you rent an apartment now? Okay. Uh, is this the apartment you're going to live in your whole life? Okay. <laughs> so, no. So when you think about, like, taking care of that apartment, you're sort of like, yeah, you know, it, it's low on your part. You're not going to make any improvements to that apartment. You're lucky if, you know, you get the, thing, the basic things fixed if something goes wrong with your apartment, things like that. However, let's suppose you had a rent-controlled apartment in New York City that was like $1,500 a month for a two-bedroom. Would you be living in that your whole life? Yes, you would. You're not giving that thing up ever, right? So you might be willing to invest all sorts of money in it because it's yours. So when you think about whether a, a lease is like a purchase or just a lease, it kind of depends on the nature of the, the, the terms of the lease. So if you're planning on leasing the asset for most of its useful life, so let's say you lease a computer, okay? I mean, that would be, most people don't do that, but let's, let's say you did and you had a three-year lease. By the end of the three-year lease, would anybody else want that computer? No, right? A computer after three years, that thing is pretty much done. So you have effectively owned it its entire life so it's kind of like you bought it, right? Because even though you technically did not have maybe legal ownership, you had economic ownership, okay? So it could be how much of the life of the asset. If you pay for it almost, night, or if you pay for it the majority of what it would have cost you to buy it outright, it's sort of like a purchase, right? If, if I effectively pay the same amount that it would have cost me if I paid up front, isn't that kind of, you know, shouldn't I, shouldn't I get the, the asset at that point? Okay, so a capital lease, there are, there are four conditions for a capital lease, and you're going to learn them in Intermediate 2. But <laughs> one of the conditions is if you own it more than 75% of the life of the firm, of the, of the asset. One of the conditions is if you pay more than 90% of it. One of the conditions is if it automatically transfers to the, to the lessor at the end of the lease, and just the last one is if you have a bargain purchase option at the end of the lease, which is the dollar. So if I'm leasing it and then you get to buy it for a dollar at the end of the lease, they're basically saying you've owned it its whole life 
yeah, you may as well keep it at the three-year stage, that computer that nobody else wants, because you know, you've, you've pretty much owned it. And if you want to keep it for parts or whatever, so be it. So those are the conditions which you don't need to know the conditions, but you need to know that when I have a lease that's a capital lease, I need to record the asset on my books as if I own it. And I need to record the liability on my books as an obligation. I am required to make these payments to uphold the payments for my asset that I've just purchased, even though I haven't legally purchased it. So that's going to show up here. Um, when I think about having to pay my employees, it's less common now than it used to be, but some companies will offer a pension. The, pension, the idea behind a pension is you say, okay, well, you work for me now and I pay you later. Why are my employees sort of okay with that? Well, they, what, what they're doing is they're saying, okay, I'm willing to forego some of my pay right now. Why is it that the obligation has to do with, why don't we just wait until we pay them and then just record an expense for their efforts? So when, when we finally have to pay their pension, so let's say 25 years from now, somebody's pension comes due and I, I make a payment. Why, why don't I record the expense at that point? Yeah. Okay, so matching says I need to record the expense with the revenue. So when did these workers work and generate revenues? Right now. When they are finally retired, they're doing nothing for me. They're actually not, so, so I want to recognize the liability associated with, you know, the wages payable 25 years from now. And that's going to be in the form of a pension, okay? So I need to kind of anticipate the obligation. How do I know how much I'm going to owe them? Well, I'm going to kind of have to try and figure that out. Okay, other things I need to always check to see whether my assets are overvalued. Now, there's a rule which says you can never record gains on assets that haven't been realized, but there is a rule which says if there's a loss on an asset, you should recognize it immediately as soon as you know it, even if it hasn't been realized. Meaning, let's say my asset has gone down in value. I don't plan on selling it. I still need to record a loss because conservatism says my assets cannot be recorded as, cannot be overvalued. And the, the rule of, you know, is it an asset or not, if it's lost market value, it probably has also lost functionality. Okay? Yeah. The germ. Okay. Okay. Over three months. That wasn't a good thing. Okay. So as soon as you know, as soon as you know your asset has no value, you have to. Your, I mean, the the le the um, requirements of GAAP say you must take an impairment. So there's, uh, you know, if there's any triggering event like some reason that it caused all the all the assets to have no value, you would have to check for impairment. If they were impaired, you have to take the hit immediately. Now, in a three-month situation, you, know, you might not actually provide financial information in between those three months, and it wouldn't really matter. But certainly, if I was talking about a 30-year asset and it died after the first year, I would need to record all those costs in the first year. Okay, if I am thinking about um, merging with another company, and I need to figure out what that company is worth, Basically, the way I figure out what something is worth is I project the cash flows and I discount them to the present, which is using the time value of money. And I can do the same thing whether it's an entire business or just a single investment project. Okay? Now, even though we do use the time value of money, there are some situations where we just ignore it, like current assets and current liabilities where we say, well, yeah, it's true. The fact that I'm giving you the product now and you're going to pay me in three months or two months or 60 days, um, it's true. You're getting something now and you're giving me something later. But rather than recording the sale at the discounted value, I assume the time frame is so short that I can just ignore the present value. 
Okay, so it's not that we always use, we don't always do things perfectly, but we try, we try to do it, we try to get it mostly right, particularly for long-term um, assets and liabilities. Okay, so I'm hoping you've seen this before in a finance class, or at least some of these ideas. If you haven't, and anything's not clear, you know, I'll, I'll just raise your hand and we'll talk about them again. But the basic stuff that you already know, and you even know it from this class, is, okay, most loans, whether you're lending or you're borrowing, come with some interest, okay? The idea behind interest is money, you know, you don't get something for nothing. So if somebody's giving you a loan, you're going to have to pay for the rights to use their cash. You, you want cash, you need cash. Why is somebody going to be willing to give it to you? Well, you're going to give them some compensation for that cash. What is that compensation? That compensation is interest. Okay. Now, interest can be explicit. So it can say, I'm going to give you $100,000. You need to pay me 8% interest. Or it can be implicit, which is, I'm going to give you something, and you're going to pay me more later. Okay. We don't actually state an interest rate, but we just it's, it's clear that what I'm giving you is worth less than what you're going to give me later. Okay. So it's not that it has to be a stated rate. All loans come with interest. Okay. You, you can never get something for nothing. Okay. How do you decide, you know, what the actual interest expense or interest amounts are going to be? Well, first you figure out how much has the company borrowed or lent. Okay. Then you have to figure out what is the interest rate. Now, if they tell you what the interest rate is, that's fine, but it could be that this is unstated and you have to back it out. And then how long are you going to keep the loan outstanding? So if I tell you I'm going to borrow $50,000 for five years, I have to make annual interest payments of 5% per year. You can easily tell me what the total interest I'm going to pay over the life of the loan is. You can tell me how much I have to pay each year. You can tell me how much. I mean, that, that's very easy to compute. So those are the situations that we really like, right? We can, you know, everything's easy to solve, and I know exactly what my obligations are, and I know exactly um, when I'm going to have to pay interest. I can accrue the interest appropriately, and so on. So let, let's, let's start simple, because it gets a little, it gets harder, but not undoable. Okay, so let's say a company borrows $100,000, and it has to make payments so let's say it borrows 100, what's today, 223? 23? Okay. Uh, I know. <laughs> I can't keep track of that. Okay, so it's 223.12. Let's say we go and borrow $100,000. And the terms are, I'm going to pay it back to 23.14 in three years. Bless you. Okay, so here's one year, two years, three years, and then I have to pay back $100,000. Now, if that was it, if we were just going to stop there right now, and I said, okay, I'm going to borrow $100,000, and I'll pay you back in three years, and I'll give you $100,000, would you want to give me, loan me that money? Okay, so maybe you can't even, so let's say I just ask you for $10 and I say, hey, I'll pay you back in three years. Would you want to do that? Why not? Yep. Okay, so let's say we're in this great, um, perfect world where the, there's no inflation at all. And $10 now really is worth $10 in the future. Would you still, would you give it to me then? Why not? Okay, so there's a whole bunch of reasons why you're not going to give me money. One is there really is a difference in $10 now and $10 three years from now, right? What you can buy for $10 now, I'll break it to you guys, Ten, you know, three years from now isn't, you're not going to be able to buy as much, okay? The second thing is, I think I'm really reliable, but maybe I'm not, okay? So there's some risk of me actually making the payment. Any other reasons why you wouldn't? Yep. 
Okay, so that would be if if my savings. I'm going to have to find out what bank you go to because my savings account doesn't pay. I and mean, I think the interest is like 0.01 percent. But okay, let's just say you could potentially get interest on it. But let, let's push that a little farther. You you probably can't just go to the bank and put your money into a completely safe thing and get a whole lot of interest at this point. But what could you do? You could do, and if you if you keep the money to yourself, you can decide what to do with it, right? You have the like when you know you want to buy an ice cream, go buy yourself an ice cream. You don't. You have you have option. You know you have sort of like the value of having ten dollars for that whole three year period, which if you give it to me, I am taking away from you. So I have to compensate you for this, right? You you have to, in order for you to be willing to give up your potential two ice creams that. In, mind you, in three years will only be one ice cream. You know, you have to. Yeah, they have to be getting something for it. So here, what they're saying is, not only I'm taking a hundred from you now, and I'm going to give you a hundred back in um, three years, but every year I'm going to make an annual interest payment of ten percent. So what does that mean at the end of two twenty three or at, on two twenty three thirteen? What am I going to do? pay $10,000 in cash. So I'm going to give you $10,000 in cash. So what you're getting, okay, in exchange for lending me the money is a total of $130,000 back. Now, is it exactly $130,000? Well, that, that's purely nominal. That's just, you know, the, the numbers I'm assigning to it, but it's what it really means is $100,000 today, the only way you'll give that to me is if I promise to pay you 10 next year, 10 the following year, 10 the following year, plus then give it all back. Okay, those two things are equivalent. So, the interest payment is easy, okay? It's just $10,000 per year. What if I were paying 10% per year or 10% semi-annually, what would that look like? It would be 5% every half year. Okay, if I paid 10% quarterly, what would that look like? Two and a quarter percent every <laughs> half, every quarter year. Okay, so it, you know, the, the, usually interest rates are given in an annual way. Now, you could argue that there's a difference between getting four quarterly payments of two and a quarter each and 10%, and there is. You're right. You would be right. Okay, so there, it, it, the more payments you get, the more interest you get. Okay, but that's how you negotiate this depends on what you think the value of having the $100,000 is today. Okay, so what would happen if we were going to, so we can, we can do this example because it's a little bit cleaner, but let's do the one that we have. Let's say we close our books on 1231.12. What do we need to do with respect to interest? Will we have made any interest payments at this point? No, right? We won't because we make our first interest payment on 223.13. So what should we be doing? Okay, so, you know, this is kind of a little bit of a pain because we're like, we have used up one week, effectively, of, we have one week in February plus March, April, May, June, July. Okay, so we have 10 months plus a week. Let's just skip the week for, <laughs> for now. So let's say we, we're going to use 10 months, so 10 twelfths of what we owe, right? How do we figure that out? Just take 10 twelfths of $10,000. What are we going to record at that, at year end? We're going to record interest expense, interest payable, or accrued interest, whatever you want to call it. Okay, why are we doing that? When are we getting the benefits of the bar of, of borrowing the money? Over the entire year. So some of those benefits are coming right in, in 2012, and some of them are coming in 
the beginning of 2013. So I need to record the expense in the period in which I'm receiving the benefits for. Okay, now if I had done this on June 30th, it would have been a lot easier. I could have just said, okay, well, I would accrue an expense of $5,000. Okay. Now, we all know that that's a pretty simplistic way to think about things. And what if interest compounds um, on itself? Okay, so let's say instead of making a payment, let's just say I know for the next three years, I'm going to be kind of cash poor. I can't even really afford to pay you $10,000 a year. Okay? Why can't I afford to pay you $10,000 a year? Well, because every money, every, every penny I make, I want to reinvest in my firm. I'm just starting up. I, I just, I don't think I'll be on my feet for another three years. So, what's that going to look like? So, now I'm explicitly telling you, I'm not going to pay you anything here. I'm not going to pay you anything here. And I'm only going to pay you all at the end. So what, how should I think about that problem? Should, should, it, should I just charge the person 130000 Should I just say, OK, that's fine. You just pay me it all at the end and give me the 130 that you would have given me in the last example? Why not? Well, but what does that mean? Okay, so I would like to get $10,000 here, but I'm not getting it. What am I doing? I'm basically lending it to you. <laughs> so you're, you're, first you borrowed $100,000 from me. Then after one year, you borrow another ten. So after a year, you've actually borrowed $110,000 from me because what you should have paid me is $10,000. So now, how much interest do I have to pay in the second year? I have to pay interest on the 110 that I've borrowed. So I need to pay $11,000 interest, right? Because I've borrowed more money from you. I should have paid you the $10,000, but I said, no, 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 I can't really afford to pay it right now, so I'm going to hang on to that. But now, effectively, you lent me $110,000. How about the next year? So you still don't, you don't give me my $11,000 interest. So what do I have to pay here? Okay, so I have borrowed 100 in the first year. Then I borrow another 10. Then I borrow another 11. So at the moment, I have borrowed 121,000, and I hold on to that for a year. How much is the interest on the, for a $121,000 loan in one year? $12,100. Okay, so this is a situation where at the end of the year, at the end of the third year, I need to pay back 100000 plus all the borrowings that I've made, which would be the 10, the 11, and the 12, 1. Okay? So instead of just paying you $130,000, how much do I have to pay you? 133, 1. Right? So does that, is it kind of obvious why paying you all at the end is going to be more expensive for me than paying you as we go? If I had paid some of the principal back, so let's suppose after the first year, not only did I pay you interest, but I also paid a third of the principal back. Would I overall end up paying back more or less than 130? Less. Why? Because after the first year, I've only borrowed, all right, 66. Because I only have to pay you interest on what's still outstanding. If I pay you back, I don't continue to have to pay you interest. Okay, so I'll pay less interest because I'm paying back not only interest, but principal. So that's sort of the way compounding works. Okay, 
for the purpose of most bonds, okay, yeah, it's true, people, there are sophisticated ways of doing continuous compounding, and um, you can imagine the compounding periods getting very small. But the reality is most bonds are written as like semi-annual or annual payments, so you can compound as much as you want, but for an accounting practical purpose, we don't actually really need to be sophisticated at compounding. We only need to do it in uh, kind of finite numbers of periods because usually there's like a 20-year bond and you make semi-annual payments, so that's just a total of 40 periods. Okay. Now, there, there are a couple of different ways to go about doing these present value problems. So we just kind of talk through how you compute this and, you know, it takes five minutes, not that big of a deal. How else can you do this? Okay, well, anyone who's taken a finance class, suggest to me, how could I have figured out this number, this 133,000, given I, this, I borrow 100, and I have to have uh, a 10% interest rate and a three-year period, what else, like, other than just the way I did it here, can you suggest any other ways? Yeah. Okay, so there's a formula, okay, which basically says I take the interest rate, 1 plus 0 0.1, which is, you know, 1.1, 1 .1, and what would I do to that? I take it to the power 3, which is the number of periods, okay, so... So 1.1 cubed. What's happening with one, when, as I cube 1.1? Well, I'm getting something bigger than 1.1. In fact, I'm going to get 1.331. Okay? I multiply that by $100,000, and I get this 1331. So if I happen to know the formula, which for next exam you can certainly write on your page of notes, but you don't need to memorize any formulas, that would be an alternate way of doing it. How else could I do it? There are still other ways. I'm sure some of you have them in your hand or on your table. Use one of those fancy calculators that you type in n equals this and p equals this and you know whatever. You can use a you can use a financial calculator. What's the drawback of using a financial calculator? You have to actually type in the numbers right. Okay, and I don't mean type them in like not make typos. I mean, you have to understand which numbers go where. So if you're ever given a slightly more complicated problem, which is like suppose I said, okay, you're going to um, have $100,000 and you're going to skip the first interest payment and make the second one and then make the third and the fourth and then skip the fifth. You could never do that with your fancy calculator unless you really understand what's going on. So sometimes I might throw a harder problem at you so I make sure you're not just like naively typing stuff into your calculator because you won't be able to use a I don't know if you can use a financial calculator on the CPA exam. Okay. Um, what else? Any other ways you've ever seen? Anyone have the textbook or a textbook? Any, in any intermediate financial accounting textbook will have a bunch of tables in there. What do the tables do? They're effectively doing exactly what your, what your calculator would be doing. It's just figuring out the value of that formula, giving you a number. So if you look on a present value table, you say, okay, well, I have three periods, 10%. This is the factor. I take 1.33. So they've just taken 1.1 1 .1 and, and, and cubed it for you. Okay? That's all those tables are doing. Tables are good. They're easy to use. They're fine. I don't, I don't feel strongly. You can use any method at all that you want to get the right answer. Okay? I want you to get the right answer, and I want you to understand it. I don't really care how you compute it. Okay? I want you to compute it in, a, in, the, in the best way that works for you. Okay. So let me just sort of add to that, which is if you were to um, borrow $100,000, 10%, is the annual rate, but the interest actually compounds every six months, then you would be paying more because effectively what you're doing is you're borrowing $5,000 more after six months 
then another five, and you have to constantly pay interest on whatever the loan outstanding is. And so the loan is bigger sooner, and so you have to pay more interest. If you have interest compounding continuously, then there's another, there's just a formula. You can, I, I prove it why it works for you, but it uses the natural log, the opposite of the natural log, which is E, okay? So you just need to use E on your calculator. You can't, this you can't do in your head. I mean, E to whatever. So that's the drawback of, of continuous compounding because all these other problems you could technically do, just write them out yourself, okay? But the idea is the difference and this is why accountants don't really care that much about continuous compounding. The difference between continuous and semi-annual compounding is just not that big. Okay, it's not that if you compound continuously, the number blows up to infinity. No, it doesn't. I mean, it, it stops right here. So you, if, if you think about, like, materiality, let's say you're going to pay 134986 in interest versus 13410 yeah, who cares, right? That's not even, it's not that big of a deal. Okay, so we're not too super worried about getting, um, moving in a direction of continuous compounding. Okay, so now we're going to throw a bunch of problems at you. They're not going to be super hard to begin with, and then they're going to get harder and harder and harder. Okay, so problems, we're going to start out where you know three out of four of the things that you need, and we need to figure out the fourth, okay? So here is, here's a, a situation I could say, I, you, you borrow or you lend a certain amount of money here. Here's how many interest periods there are. How much are you going to get at the end, okay? So what would a situation be like for that is I, put a, I make a deposit into a bond sinking fund and I put it in the stock market and it earns a certain rate of interest, how much will it be worth? Will I have enough to pay back my bond five years from now? So that kind of question. Or I know I need $100,000 here for an investment project. How much do I have to put in today? That would be the opposite kind of problem. Or I have $100,000 now. How long will it take at this rate of interest to be worth 120? Okay, so that's when I don't know the number of periods, I know the other ones. Or what kind of interest rate do I need to earn, or what kind of interest do I need to earn on this in order for it to be worth 120 four years from now if it's worth 100 now? Okay, so you can answer any of those questions as long as you know three out of these four things. Okay, so let's suppose we've got a company where they need... $84,253 $84, in five years, okay? And you're going to earn 11% interest per year. And the question is, how much do I have to put into my account today so that it'll be worth $84,000, $84,253? Don't do this yet. One of the things I always find troubling when people do things on exams or is that they don't actually think rationally about what the answer should look like before they go and take a stab at the problem. And then they think they know how to do it, they do it wrong, and then they come up with an answer like $150,000. Don't tell me what the number is. If I put money in here and I'm going to put it in something that's earning 11% per year, okay, and I don't take out any of the interest, and at the end it's worth 84, what can you tell me about this number? Yeah. It's got to be less than 84, okay? So don't ever give me an answer that's more than 84, right? Because if I just put 84,253 in an account and it earned nothing for five years, it would be worth $84,253 five years later. So you got to assume, well, hey, if it's earning interest, I don't need as much here. Okay, so now how are we going to do this problem? So what do you suggest? Yeah. Okay, so there's, there's a formula I could use. I could just figure out some formula. 
Okay, what else could I do? I could look at a table. I could use my calculator. I, okay, so let's just think about how it really works. So let's just say I don't know what this number is. This number is X. I'm putting some amount in. After one year, I have 1.1 times X, right? Because I have the X plus 11% of that, okay? In the second year, I have this which is what I had at the end of the first year, times another 1.11. Okay, so this is end of the first year. Okay, you can see where this is going, right? After the end of the year two. So what's happening is I'm basically taking every year, I'm multiplying by another 1.1, or 1.11. So the formula... I don't want you to memorize the formula, I want you to be able to derive the formula, is just how much I start with times 1.1 to the number of periods. Okay, so this is how many periods. In this case, it's five years, right? So if I want to be more general, this would be 1 plus r to the t. And after five years, that has to be 84, 253. Okay? I know 1 plus r, this is just 1.11. I know this is 5 years. Okay, I have one equation, one unknown. I can solve that problem. Okay, it's easy. It's not, I mean, yeah, sometimes people look at these math equations and they think, oh, it, just think about it as an economics problem and you can, you'll have much better intuition. Yeah. Not, well, not necessarily. What, I mean, what you could have done instead is you could say, okay, I have x plus 0.11 times x. But if I simplify that, I'm getting one point. So this would be how much I start with. Oh, well, yeah, I mean, you could, you could in your calculator, you could type it as 11% or you could type it as 0.11 doesn't matter to me, um, but you have to just, I mean, you can't type it as 11 straight up. Okay, other questions? Okay, so what is the answer? How much do I need to invest today in order to get 84,253 five years from now? 50,000. Okay, so when, not that I'm sort of telling you what to do with your lives, but I am going to tell you a little bit what to do. So, you know, when you start your first job, they're going to, you're going to go to the benefits office and they're going to say, sign up for benefits and, um, and you're going to, they're going to say, how much would you like to put in your optional retirement account or would you like to have an IRA or they'll ask you these kinds of questions. And you're going to think, I'm 25 years old, who are we kidding? I don't need to worry about retirement. Okay. This is, the, this is a mistake. <laughs> you should start saving for your retirement right now. Why? Because, not because anything's going to happen to you, but because you don't need that much in order for it to turn into a lot. Now, of course, there's always the chance that your investment loses money, okay? So it's not like it's a sure thing. You're not going to get 11% per year on average, okay? But if you're incredibly risk averse, you can always put it in something fairly safe and at least get some return on it, okay? Whereas if you don't save any money, you're going to have to come up with, you know, $884,000 on the spot when something happens, right? So basically, invest, the more, the, invest what you can as early as you can because just time works in your favor, turning it into more money in the future, okay? So there's my little, <laughs> please, please save, okay? <laughs> And who knows what's going to happen to Social Security by the time you guys are ready to collect it. So, okay. <laughs> All right, so now let, let's go the other way. Um, let's say instead you were given the question, which is, I have $50,000. It's, you know, it was a great day. I won the lottery, and I just got a $50,000 paycheck that I wasn't expecting. And I don't really need it. I mean, I need it, I want it, but I don't need it right now. So I'm going to put it in this account, and I want to know what's it going to be worth five years from now at 11% interest. What's the answer? 
$84,000, sorry, so, so if I know the beginning, I mean, this way, you, you wouldn't normally know that without doing the calculation, but what would I have done differently? Well, I would take the $50,000, and I would just multiply it by 1.11 to the fifth, and I would get 84,253. Okay, so these are what we call single sum problems, okay? All your, you're just solving for one chunk of money that you either put in at the beginning or you take out at the end, okay? And here are some other, I, you can look at other ways of doing it. There's formulas, there's table information. I am perfectly happy with whatever approach you choose. Okay, now I'm going to give you five minutes. You do these two. I'm going to give you a hint. They're not the same answer <laughs> as each other, so you actually have to do two separate problems and see whether you can come up, and, and they're a little bit, not a lot harder, but a little bit harder because we're talking about now semi-annual compounding, okay? It's not harder theoretically, it's just you have to remember to convert the interest rate to a semi-annual amount, but also double the number of periods. Okay, so we have, if we have three years semi-annually, that's six payments, okay? Sorry, since we'll, okay, so 50,000 we need at the end, okay? Okay. If, I, if the rate is 12% per year, do I get the full, do I get, you're right, so what do I have to do? Okay, so I take one plus the rate over two, because it's semi-annual, so I'm getting you know, two payments per year, but then I also have to take the number of years times two, right? So in this sense, I have x times 1.06, but it's also raised to the six. And it's just totally coincidence that this is a six and that, it, that is just completely arbitrary. Okay, don't, don't think that they're in any way related. Okay, so I have three years, but six semi-annual periods. I would get an annual rate of 12%, but that means I only get 6% every six months. Okay, so that's, and that has to equal $50,000. So. The formula technically is the amount divided by, or you could just say times one divided by 1.06 to the six, 
gives you the present value. So what's the value? Okay, so two, five, two, four, eight. Okay, so does everyone agree with this number? Did anyone do it differently? Did anyone use their calculator? Okay, did it work? Did anyone use the table? The tables are, they, they work, they're good. Just, I mean, you have to have it with you, but. Okay, so I will, maybe I'll make, I'll, I'll post on Blackboard um, some tables as well. So if you don't have the book, you can certainly use tables. Okay, how about the other direction? So if I invest $40,000 today, how much will it be worth in three years if it compounds at a semi-annual rate of 12%? Don't stop, don't tell me the answer yet. We just solved this one and we all agree. If I put in $35,000 and I have all the same conditions, at the end of six periods, it's going to be worth 50. So now I'm telling you, you're going to put in 40. What must your answer be? Bigger than what? Well, okay, so first of all, it has to be bigger than 40 because it has to earn some interest. What even, what does it even have to be bigger still? Then 50, right? Because if we put in 35, we get 50. So if we put in 40, we better get more than we put, get if we put in 35, right? So do some reality checks before you answer um, these present value problems, especially when you're relying on a black box calculator. Okay, so I put in 40. There's six periods, and it's 12% uh, per year, semi-annual payments. What's it worth at the end of six periods? 56,740. Everyone agree? OK. Any questions at all on how to do these problems? You feel good about them? They're comfortable? They work. OK. So we can move on to harder things. So that's, let's say we don't know now one of the other two things that we could have not known. So let's suppose, oops, let's suppose we, we know that we're trying to build a monument and it's going to cost us $70,000. And we had a fundraiser, and we earned 47,811. Okay, and for whatever reason, we have a commitment from the monument builder that, regardless of what year we actually engage their services, they will do it at a cost of seventy thousand dollars for us. So we were hoping we would raise the full seventy now, but we only raised forty-seven thousand. So what we're going to do is we're going to deposit it in an account that earns. 10% interest per year and just wait until it is big enough to get the monument built. How long is it going to take us to get that monument built? Okay. You think it's going to take about four years? Anyone else have anything to say about that? Agree, disagree? Okay. How did you get four years? How did you, how did you do it? Okay, so there's a formula, right? It says uh, 47,811 times 1.1 to the some number n is equal to 70,000. Okay, so then how did you, I mean, how did you solve that problem? Okay, so you use the financial calculator or you use the formula? 
Okay, but so what did you need to enter to get this N? Okay, so that's what I'm at. That's what I want. Okay, so in case you, you're rusty on your math, okay, just in case that's possible, first, you know, you, you can easily divide both sides by 47, 8, 11, but then you're still stuck with this thing, okay? So what you want to have is I'm, I need to know what is N. So what I do is I take the natural log of both sides, okay? What is, what are those, remember those log things that you learned, I don't know, gosh, in 12th grade, 8th, 11th grade, whatever? Okay, so you, when you take the log of something that has an exponent, it's the same as n times the log of 1.1 is equal to the log of 70,000. Now we can just do n is equal to that. Okay, so I wanted you to tell me all that because some people wouldn't have remembered that log trick. Yeah. No, so you can use a you can use a financial calculator. It will tell you that, right? It will tell it will solve that. It's doing it exactly this way. That's what it's doing. Yeah. Oh, right. Oh, sorry. Okay. So, 70,000 divided by 47811. So, whatever that number is. 464. Okay. Thanks. Okay, so anyway. But the idea is this is not hard, it's just you have to just remember a couple little tricks. If you know, the formula is the same no matter what, okay? There's pretty much, we're using the same formula over and over and over again. It's just a matter of which variable do you not know. And if the variable happens to be the exponent, we just need to take the trick of use, taking the log of both sides. Okay, let's do the last one, which, yeah. Right, so uh, well, I think what you have, I mean, I think they do a lot, they might allow you to take in a, a basic calculator, but I'm not even sure about that. But what you have to do in those situations would be interpolate. So they'll give you a table. What they'll do is they'll give you, like, it'll be a multiple choice question or something, and they'll say, here are the, so they'll give you, like, this column and, um, and like, the number of years, okay? And you'll have to look and say, okay, well, I know that I need the number to be that 1.46 thing. So what is the number that's closest in the table to that? Okay, so that's how you would do it that way, okay? Um, and then, um, okay, so what if you have, you know the original investment, it's 800,000, okay? You know it's going to be four years, and you know it's going to end up being a million four. How do you how do you do that? So now I don't know the interest rate. Okay, so it's not any harder. Okay, I'm just going to change my color of pen since I wrote all over the place, and it's hard to see what which is which. Okay, so here. Okay, I take 800,000 times one point something, okay? I don't know what that something is. I raise it to the fourth, whoops, come up here, hello, and I get a hundred, a million four hundred, okay? Now, this is a little bit harder because you need to be able to take the fourth root with your calculator. If you don't have a fancy calculator, it's a little bit harder, okay? So, you then you need to use a table and interpolate again, okay? And you figure out, okay, well, what do I need to, to get the right answer, okay? But in any event, we're st we've used one formula and we've solved four different kinds of problems, okay? So here I would have to say divide 1, 4 divided by 800, take the fourth root, and I would get one point something that the point part is what I'm solving for, and it's approximately 15%. Does everyone agree, based on your own doing of it? Okay. So here's the other way you would do it. You would go to the table, okay? Oh, no, this is number three. Okay, so you go to the table. You take 
the 14 divided by 800, you get 1.76. And then you have to figure out what number in the table is how many years. Um, no, not five. You have the number of years. So you look, a, you look instead of a, you look looking within a column, you look across a row, and you say, oh, it must be 12% or 15. I don't know. I, I must have changed. I changed the numbers because I thought it was. So, but that's how you would do it. I think I'm, I, I think I changed the numbers to one four, and it ended up being fifteen percent instead of one four oh nine. But um, but the idea is the same. Okay. All right. So everyone's good with the simple stuff. Now we're going to talk about the stuff that is a little bit more complicated, but also more interesting. Okay, so now let's suppose instead of just you put money in and you take it out later or you take, you know how much you have later or how much you want later and how much you need to put in today. Now we're going to talk about stuff that actually really happens or happens more frequently, which would be, let's suppose I'm considering should I buy or lease an asset. Now, sometimes this question is not really a choice. You just don't have enough money up front, so you don't really have the option of paying for it outright. But you want to make sure that when you lease the asset, you're getting a fair deal. So usually when you lease an asset, okay, you have to make payments periodically. You don't just say, give me the asset now and I'll pay you the whole amount five years from now. Usually you say, okay, I'll make you rent or lease payments every year. So I'll give you $100,000 every year so that I can have this asset. Should I do that or should I give them $350,000 up front? Now, obviously you can't answer that question purely on a map. I mean, you have to know more about the company. But if you want to answer that question, you have to start by figuring out how much does the lease cost me versus how much does paying up front cost me. And I need to be able to compare those two things in a sensible way. Obviously, if I make lease payments, they're going to be higher in total than the payments I would make up front. But does that necessarily mean it's a worse deal? Right? If I can pay $100,000 a year for five years or three fifty dollars up front, which is a better deal? Can you answer that question? How, what would you need to know? Okay, or what the hundred, the five, the stream of five payments would be worth today, and I compare it to the three fifty. What else would I need to know? The interest rate. Okay, I need to know how much interest I should be charged. Okay, so the difference in, when we think about an annuity problem, an annuity is basically just a periodic payment for to make our lives easy we're going to always consider payments of the same amount rather than constantly changing payments it's not that you can't do it with constantly changing payments it's just the formulas don't you have to be a lot more you have to do a lot more work okay we're going to have the same length interval between payments so we make a payment every year every 6 months we don't make one now, and then one eight months from now, and then another 16 months from then, and then another three months thereafter. We kind of at least have some stability there. And we assume that interest compounds once in each payment interval. Okay? Now, there are two possibilities further. I can make my first payment immediately. Or I can make my first payment... after the first period. Now, give me an example, a real world example, of a case where you make, you make payments, regular payments every month, say, but you put some money down immediately. Mortgage, okay. When you, when you take out a car loan, right, they say put 249 down and then $249 every month or something like that. Okay, what you're doing is you're making your first payment right now, and then you're making subsequent payments every month. 
try not to take out car loans. They're bad loans. Okay. <laughs> I know sometimes they're unavoidable, but you avoid at all costs. Okay. On the other hand, what are some examples, real world, where you don't have to make a first payment? Okay, credit cards. Although credit card payments are usually different all the time, so that's the. Uh, sorry. Yeah. So a lot of times you like you see these furniture stores having a big sale. No money down. No payments for a year. Blah blah blah. You know they're like they're okay. You think they're giving you something for nothing? No, they are not. You are going to be paying for it. You're just not going to pay for it right now. So you have no money right now. You can go get new furniture, but the reality is it will come and get you eventually. Yeah. Student loans. So that's true. Um, the thing is about student loans is you're usually borrowing more and more so that the payments, I guess as soon as you start paying them, they would be consistent and you don't have to pay them till the end. Yeah. Other situations? Okay. So clearly, it, it, you can imagine both of these things happening and so we kind of need to deal with both of them. We call it, I don't know what, the names are totally stupid and they don't have anything to do with kind of the, 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 there's no linkage between what it is and the name, but when you make the payment now, the first payment right away, okay, it's called an ordinary annuity, okay? And when you make the payment, no, it's the opposite. <laughs> Sorry. All right. When you make the first payment immediately, it's called an annuity due, okay? Because it's like, I guess, due right now. Although, I mean, it, it, I don't really, okay? And if you make the first payment at, at the end of the first period, okay, it's called ordinary. So that's not really so super important, other than if you were to use a table you would just have to make sure you were looking at the right annuity table, whether it's ordinary or annuity due. If you use any other technique, you don't really have to know the name of it, okay? Um, so, let's talk about what this is like. It is, why do we need these kind of annuity computations? Well, we need to think about valuing an asset today. So let's say, I'm not deciding should I lease or should I buy, I'm just saying I'm going to lease an asset. But accounting says even though legally you're leasing it, it's really like a purchase. And so we want you, so let's say I'm going to lease a building for 25 years, okay? I want the company to have an asset called building and I want them to have a liability for lease payments for the building. Okay, so it's almost as if I'm purchasing the building on credit. That's the way I treat a capital lease. Now, because there aren't, it's not like there are 100,000 of these buildings and there's an invoice price. There's just one building that's exactly like the one that I'm buying. So I don't really know what the value of this building is. How am I going to figure out what to record as the historical cost of the building on my balance sheet? Because I'm not actually paying for it right now, so I don't have a cost. I could ask my realtor, well, what do you think it's worth? But the realtor could say 20 million, the realtor could say 26 million, 13 million, like, who knows? I could ask 10 different people, they might all disagree. What is the best evidence of what it's worth? How much I actually pay for it? Well, how, how much am I, you know, that's kind of a historic, but how much am I actually paying for it? Should I, if I pay, say, a million dollars a year for 25 years, should I just say that's $25 million? I have to take the present value of $25 million because if I bought it right now, I would pay a lot less. I don't want to distort the value of my building with the value of borrowing money, which is essentially what I'm doing. What I'm doing is I'm borrowing a building. I'm not borrowing cash, but I'm borrowing a building, and I'm not paying for it. So I have two benefits. I have the building, which is genuinely an asset, but I also have the loan 
which is creating value for me by my not having to use cash for other things. So I want to disentangle the portion that's due to interest and the portion that's due to the genuine building value. If I record the building at $25 million, it's way too high. Nobody would be willing to pay $25 million for that building right now. What you're willing to pay $25 million for is the building with this term that I only have to pay a million dollars a year. Okay. On the other hand, it, you know, it can go the flip side. If I want to be sure that I can pay my employees their pensions when they're due, how much do I have to put in each year so that I'll have enough when they finally say, I'm cashing out, I'm done. Okay. So those are the, the situations where we kind of care about this. You know, if you know the amount that you're putting in, you can figure out what it's going to be worth at the end or what it's going to be, what, what the, those future payments are worth the, right now. Either way, whether you figure out the present value or the future value. Okay, so let's say this company or a company is going to deposit $5,000. So we're standing here today, okay? At the end of each of five years, they're going to deposit $5,000 into an account. It earns 12% interest compounded annually. Don't do anything. What is, what is that $5,000 each year going to be worth at the end of five periods? Don't, don't give me an answer. Is it going to be worth more or less than $25,000? Is everyone sure it's more? Right? Is there any way it could be less? Assuming I don't earn negative interest, right? So as long as I put, I put $5,000 in at the end of this year, what's that going to be worth in four years? It's going to be worth 5000 times 1.1 raised to the fourth, right? Because I have all this interest compounded. Then a year, two years from now, I put in another 5000 Well, I have that 5000 plus all the interest it gets. Well, how much interest does it get? It gets three years worth of interest. Two years worth of, okay? So you all, we're you, effectively, we're using the same stupid formula we've been using. We're just going to use it a couple of times in a row, okay? So here I have $5,000. What's it worth at the end of four years? Now, you might be saying, well, what do you mean? It's, isn't it the end of five years? Well, it's not the end of five years because I don't put it in until the end of the first year. So how many periods does it have to gather interest? It has one, two, three, four. It has four periods in which it's earning interest. So I would take the $5,000, okay, and that first payment that I deposit is worth $5,000 times 1.12 raised to the fourth. And then the second deposit is worth $5,000 times 1.12 to the third. 1.12 squared. And the last deposit is just worth $5,000. So the last deposit I make at the very end of the fifth year, and now I'm tallying it up at the end of the fifth year, has that deposit had any chance to earn interest? No. So it's just worth $5,000. Okay? So that's what it is. Now, they've basically done it for you. They say, well, this first one, okay, would be you'd multiply it a dollar by 1.57. So if you invest $1 for, you know, in an ordinary lump sum kind of way, you would just say, okay, after four years of gathering interest, it's worth 1.57. That's when you get 12% interest. So five, just multiply that number by 5,000. And do the same for all of these, add them up, and that's what you get. Now, instead of having to do that formula five times over, you could instead just use a table which computes this number. It already does all that summing for you. So it would just say, oh, just take $5,000 times 6.35. Or use your calculator. Okay, but really, if you learn one formula, that's plenty. You will be able to do all of these problems. You just have to be a little bit creative on using them correctly. 
but you really only need one formula. And I don't, like, I'm not really interested in whether you can get your calculator to get spit out the right value as much as that I see you understand the, the, the basic ideas of time value formulas. Okay? So, what we're going to do next class is we're going to talk about a couple more examples, more annuities, more annuities. And those are some kind of cool problems, real world problems. Um, if you if you get a chance, it wouldn't be a bad idea. So I, I this guy I did not find I did not make him up. He this is really an article I took out of Yahoo News about a guy who won the lottery and he's trying to figure out and he's asking smart people like you what he should do with his money. So he's a clerk. He has twenty eight dollars and ninety six cents to his name and then he wins the two hundred and fifty eight million dollar Powerball jackpot. When you win that jackpot. You don't actually win the 258 that they say. You win 258 over 29 year, 29 periods, or you can take out a lump sum. And he's trying to figure out which should he do. Should he take the $125 million now, or should he take the annuity payment? And so th those are the kind of computations we're eventually going to be able to solve.